ultimate superstar, a phenomenon, are just a few of the titles bestowed upon my guest tonight. On screen, he has redefined stardom. Off screen, he remains undefined, an enigma. I am delighted and honored to have a personal rendezvous with the man who is a legend, Amitabh Bachchan. Amitji, I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Thank you for having me. The first chapter of your father's autobiography is entitled, Kya Bhunu, Kya Yaad Karo. Mm -hmm. And that's my dilemma today. What shall we forget? What shall we remember? But what I remember very clearly about you is that, do you remember when we used to meet before, before your phenomenal success? Mm -hmm. I recall that even though you were struggling, you, you seemed to enjoy people and life more than you seem to now. You laughed easily. You made others laugh a lot as well. I've been wanting to ask you, what happened to that Amitabh? It's still there, very much. Uh, I think the laughter and the, and, the, uh, and the informality that you so vividly talk about has, uh, has remained with me. Uh, it's a part of me. If it was there then, uh, it can't possibly vanish. I, I see a big change in you from uh, the early 70s. It's a big change in your personality. Huge. No, I don't believe it. <laughs> I'm telling you. You don't look as happy as you did before. Oh, I, I think that's, um, th that's not entirely correct. Um, I think it happens with any human being. You know, when you're younger, you have, uh, you have fewer responsibilities, you have uh, <coughs> so many more things to be free about, about happy about. As you go along, your, your, your responsibilities increase your, in your work, your, your social responsibilities, your family responsibilities. But um, yes, uh, the freedom that one has when one is younger. That is Obviously, it's different, yes. yes. It's, it's totally different. So after 72, <coughs> after Sanjeev became the, the days of heady success, I think things changed for you in the 80s. That was a time of trials and tests, wasn't it? Well, I'd like to believe that every day is a time of trial and test as far as I've been concerned. You feel that? Oh, yeah, sure. Every day? Every day, even now. That's a burden to carry. No, I, I think... Um, I view it as part of life and uh, uh, part of something that uh, one has to live with and, and survive with and uh, be happy with. I look at it very positively. It's not, uh, it's not a burden at all. But what would you <coughs> say has been the hardest time for you? Since you mentioned the 80s, uh, um, the accident in 82, which mm. was uh, physically very traumatic to me. Mm. Um, uh, the whole uh, political imbroglio, which was mm. uh, somewhat traumatic physically, but more uh, mentally traumatic. Mm. Um, yes, I, I guess these two would be the two very prominent publicly known incidents. I, I'm sure that there must be several others, but... Tell me about that political yeah. experience. <coughs> I, uh, I'm not a politician. I was, I was never one. It was an emotional decision to uh, mm. get into politics. Uh, the fact that and Mr. Rajiv Gandhi and his family uh, and our family had been known to each other and shared a, a friendly relationship over several years and it prompted me to um, want to stand by a friend and uh, that was the sentiment but you know politics is not about sentiment it's it's far far removed from that mm. but politics is about uh, a lot many more things uh, I don't need to expand on that. And obviously I was not qualified for that. I was uh, an absolute novice. I don't think I've, I've, er I've ever admitted this anywhere else before, but I had a feeling about my inadequacy during that 
month long period when I was actually canvassing for the elections mm. in December 1984. Um, and I was in Allahabad and uh, in the middle of that month, uh, one night, very late, I, I just uh, threw up my hands and I talked to my parents who were there mm -hmm. along with me and I talked to Jay and I said, um, I think I'm making a mistake mm -hmm. and I would not like to go through with this. And uh, please help me because I'm terribly uncomfortable. And uh, there were three different reactions from my wife, my mother, and my father. Mm. Well, Jay, for instance, was was uh, was very upset by the fact that I withdrew from the political from scene. the political scene because she felt it was um, it was an attitude of defeat, and I said, no, it's uh, this is not an attitude of defeat. I am fighting, but I don't want to fight in that arena. I want to choose my own field, my own space. What about your parents? My father said, if you're not happy with this, pack your bags, we go back tomorrow. My mother said, once we're in it, we're going to fight, we're going to win, and then, if you want to leave, we'll go back. I followed my mother. Mm. I, I fought, very surprisingly, I won against uh, a huge adversary. Uh, that was all very good. But you know, I was unhappy. And uh, almost simultaneously with the decision to leave came uh, political accusations, uh, which uh, were very grave in nature, very hurtful, and indeed uh, very troublesome and traumatic. Firstly, of course, I was, um, I was unable to understand the, the nature of the attack and uh, what it was all about. A lot of my colleagues in Parliament warned me, uh, apprised me and said, you know, you're not um, looking at it correctly. You don't know what you're into. You, know, you don't know where this is going to lead. Mm. Uh, please do something about it. And I uh, tended to ignore it because I had been attacked previously for almost 15 years uh, by the film press. But this was another ball again. game. This was something else. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. People have very short memories, uh, but I was looking through the papers of the 80s, the early 80s and the 90s, and I was <coughs> amazed by the assault of publicity that you received. If mm. I was amazed, you must have been shell-shocked. There was a lot of venom and calumny, and all the allegations, the insinuations. What did it do to your peace of mind? Well, it's, it's, uh, it absolutely shatters and destroys your peace of mind. I, uh, I'm really fortunate and happy that I can smile about yeah. it and, and talk about it today, but I know for sure that when it started and during the time that it used to happen, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a, it was a hell. It was hell because you, um, you lay awake the whole night, um, wondering what the morning papers yeah. would bring. And uh, you were the first person to get up. And never have I ever waited so patiently for the, uh, the guy that delivers the papers than during those times, because uh, you wanted to see where the new attack was and where the abuse was and uh, how damaging it mm -hmm. was to your system. But I think, you know, life is, uh, uh, and the human body is such a wonderful um, structure that mm -hmm. 
we are built to uh, take a lot of pain, a lot of um, damage, and uh, still be able to uh, come out of it uh, alive, smiling, kicking. Even though at that time we feel that this is the end of the world. Absolutely. Oh, yes. And I will never be able to survive this. Absolutely. Somewhere, somehow, you get the energy. How can, uh, how can you forget when, you're, when you call your son and he says, uh, Dad, uh, hang in there and fight. We are with you. Uh, it's an emotion that just drives you to take on the entire world, which is what I was ready to do at that point of time. I recall that you wrote some poetry. It reveals, I think, the poetic spirit of your father, which you've inherited. I'm going to read it out to you. You might have forgotten it. May 3rd, 1987. Many battles have I fought in my life. I have battled for my existence, battled for my success, battled against death. But this battle which I fight now is unique. It is a battle which I must confess I've already lost. And then you go on to say, I must begin first with a confession. The media has beaten me very comprehensively. They have succeeded in tarnishing my image and defaming my character to such an extent that henceforth, whatever I may have to say in defense or in denial shall never be accepted as the truth. The damage has been done. And then you go on later. Having thus fulfilled your journalistic deed, have you really cared to look back and see the spoils of your attack? Has it ever occurred to you and your illustrious clan that you may have damaged the individual beyond repair? And what of those who are near and dear to him? The innocent children, the aging parents, one stepping cautiously to face the world, the other wanting to step off it graciously. What fault is it of theirs? Has it crossed your mind? Has it ever occurred? Has it? There's a deep anguish in this. Yes. <sighs> um, that, that's what I went through during that time. Mm. You know, they, they, were, they were terrible times. Uh, you did fight, and you fought back. I think the turning point where I decided that I should fight was when my father one day called me and said, Beta, tum kuch galat kaam nahi kar rahe. And I felt that if the onslaught of the press is so deep and so sharp to affect my father to say this, then um, I need to do something about it. And uh, that's when my brother and me decided to fight. And you won. Anaji. Do you, do you feel misunderstood? Um, let me put it this way. Does it really matter? Because um, I think if people who matter to you understand you, that would suffice. But I think uh, being misunderstood and being understood has been important for you, which is why you wanted to clear up your name and, uh, against all those the Beaufort's allegations. Absolutely right. Your, yes, I did. Because it was an attack on my character, on my honor, on the honor of my family, and the name of my family. Yeah. And I felt it uh, my bounden duty as the son of my father and the son of my mother to do that. That was the driving force. If I'm going to feel as strongly as that in any other episode, I shall happily repeat that thing. So tell me, do you think this is, in a way, your second innings? If you like to put it that way. Do you feel that? I won't fight it. <laughs> do you feel that this comeback is almost as tough as the debut that you made? Oh, yes. Now, now that I look into it, it's, it's, it's worse than that. Why? You don't have the advantage uh, of, of age with you. And you're, you're spending more time in front of your makeup man than in front of a camera. No, and I think you're exaggerating. <laughs> seriously, don't go by what you see. This is an excellent makeup job. <laughs> it's that good. <laughs> but you know, Amiji, you could have very happily rested on your laurels. You could have sat there and watched everybody else trying to measure up to the standards you had set. 
I, I set no standards. And I'm a Jew. Hard, it's a terrible way to look at, uh, at life and say, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to measure up to me. No, you have set standards. That's, that's terrible. <laughs> you know, you're a really funny person because you don't, you don't like criticism, I can imagine, but you don't like praise either. I just want to be treated normally and naturally. But you cannot be treated normally and naturally because you haven't had a normal and natural life. Whatever you may say. Normal and natural professional life, yes. No, not a normal and natural professional life. You have had what many would call a privileged life. Ah, that's a new one. Statue. I love that. <laughs> a privileged life. It is. Okay, thank but you. But I, I ask you, are you in the same boat as them? Are you also competing with the Amitabh that uh, was there in the first innings? You know, this is, this is a, a good question and a very tough one. I'm just happy that I'm around, sincerely. This is a wonderful feeling because um, I'm 56 and there really is no room for a 56-year-old actor. You know, it's a miracle that I'm still here and I find it very stimulating, very exciting, very undeserving at times to be um, bracketed with the present generation. I really don't have a, uh, I don't have a place with them. We have to do something about this modesty thing you're going through. This I is reality. This is factual. This is, this is the real thing. This is as honest as I can get. Come really, on. look at it. I, I, you know, what am I doing here? You know, with with Shahrukh and Salman and Amir and and Anil and Sunny and Govinda. I'm I'm not supposed to be there. I'm desperately trying to match uh, uh, dancing steps with Govinda in a film called Bade Mia Choti Mia. I'm desperately trying to do my action as well as. Ajay Devkan in, in Major Saab. But you know, uh, I can't possibly match them. But I, why are you trying to match them and why are you trying to match not, their dance step? No, I'm not. I'm trying to say that I've been placed in this situation and I can't keep up with them. Let's put it that way. You cannot be placed into a situation today with that corporation behind you. You can call the shots, Amitji. No, it's, it's not as easy as, as people make it out to be. No, if you can't today, at this stage of your career, get the best writers to write out the, the roles that you feel would suit you, where you don't have to try and match Govinda yeah. or try and match... Uh, okay. Un you would. I, I'll accept that point. Maybe I never did that. But then I never did that in my entire life. Um, it was always yeah. somebody structuring something for me. And I find it awkward to be doing it now. A lot of people do seem surprised why you're not doing that. Well, maybe after this interview, I will. <laughs> you know, there are demons that drive people to achieve things. It's the dark side. It's the fear of, of perhaps not being left out, of anonymity, or something that doesn't let you stop. Is there some such thing with you? Always. What is it? Uh, fear of failure. Yeah. Fear of uh, not being recognized. Fear of... Um, losing uh, uh, whatever you may have built up. Um, fear of, as you say, anonymity. It's, um, it's a terrible feeling. confusing about women? Nothing. I, I think they're, they're wonderful persons and I, I love their presence and I love being in their company. Do you understand them? My wife would probably slit my throat for this, but yes, I do. Do you really? I mean, that's quite something, you know. Yeah. Can you predict what their reactions will be? Yes, I can. Like how? I can't tell you that because, you know, 
I'd ruin my association with you. Try. I, you know, I want to be a friend of yours. You are my friend. I don't want you to pick up that lamp and slobber me. <laughs> Is it such a bad <laughs> thing I'm going to say? OK, tell me then, what are the qualities that you like most in a woman? Um, a, bit, a bit of conservatism, some traditional qualities, something more trendy, more with it, someone you'd like to protect. Men feel wonderful when they are protective about women physically, emotionally. Uh, someone you'd like to work for mm. 22 hours a day. Someone you'd like to bear your children. Someone you'd like to share moments of the children growing up with. When they get married, the children, to share that moment. And then the grandchildren. It's, um, it's someone that you want all the time around you, not necessarily physically. You may be thousands of miles away, but you should feel her presence next to you. You've also said that I like women to take charge of me. Mm -hmm. If they're qualified for the job, that is. Sure. What qualifications are necessary for the job? Ah, I wish they could just manage my day for me, you know. Mm -hmm wake me up, tell me where I have to go, what I have to do, give me a good meal, and just take care of my house, make it look beautiful. No point to uh, any applications coming because there's no vacancy. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> One rumor that comes up, like a virus every few years, is your link up with Rekha. Mm -hmm. Why does that happen? What generates it? Ask the people who generate it. Who generates it? The media. Is it just the media, you feel? Well, if there's somebody else, uh, I must be made aware of it. Do you, <coughs> do you ever meet each other? She has been uh, my, uh, my co-star and colleague. Uh, and when we were working together, uh, obviously, we met each other. Um, socially, we have nothing in common. That's about it. You haven't met each other since? Yes. I mean, sometimes we uh, bump into a, uh, each other at a, at a function which is, uh, you know, where an award function, for example, or at a social gathering. But that's about it. But there's been no interaction since no. you stopped working together? No, we haven't worked for, for donkey's years. And there's no social interaction? Not at all. Do these rumors bother you? No. I face these accusations mm -hmm. month after month. But um, quite honestly, some of the more recent accusations have been <laughs> rather ridiculous. Um, there were claims that I had moved in with her in her house and that she'd moved into my house. And they had photographs of, of that house where I'd uh, been keeping her, so to say, uh, which is just a big joke. That house uh, is mine. My family stays there. My ailing parents live there. I look after them. I think it's, it's terribly insensitive of the media to post these accusations over me without any kind of verification, without any kind of truth. I would like to ask some of them whether they have actually seen me doing something immoral or something unacceptable with the concerned lady. I would like to ask them, when was it that you saw the the two of us together, which gave an impression to you of uh, any kind of link-up. Behind the stoic exterior, what lies there? There lies a human being, which is as normal as anyone else, uh, who has uh, human feelings, uh, feelings of love, of pain, of joy, of sorrow, uh, much like any other human being in the world. Yeah. Well, you made this into a very special evening for me. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you for this rendezvous. Thank you. Thank you.